We're going to go ahead and go live on YouTube. And we're going live. Hold on just a second. We're just about to go live on Facebook. Oh. You don't need to see me. And YouTube is watching me do this right now, typing in so we can go live on Facebook. Okay, now we are, we're live on Facebook as well. Okay, can you tilt the screen so that? Yes. There we go. All right. Can you start a bit phone over there? Thank you. And are we, I just want to double check. No. And we've got it recording. And if you want to shift around, feel free. So that Absolutely. You're not seeing back of the computer. Right? Okay. There we go. Well, thank you for your patience. Sorry about that. Um, another technical glitch. But <laughs> in any case, thank you all for coming out to see Lori. This is, in fact, the book launch of Back to the Garden, which is a new book with a new lead character, Inspector, Inspector Raquel Lane of the San Francisco PD, wonderful character. Um, and as I've said, when I've written to you, one of the things I love about this book is that in some senses you could call it an historical novel, even though there is a contemporary crime, but much of the book takes place in the 1970s. And I realized when I was thinking about it that when I started the store in 1989, the 1930s were 50 years back and that was considered historical. Um, there was even sort of a little thing about the 20s. Did people think it was really far enough back to call historical fiction? Or were we going to be doing nothing but Victorian and World War I books? And that was the bar. And then I realized it's been 50 years since the 1970s, which is roughly the same gap. And I could move the bar for historical fiction forward. So this is actually our historical fiction book of the month for September. But here's what's really cool. Laurie is the rare, maybe almost unique, no, there's no almost, possibly the first author of, right, of historical fiction who actually lived in the period that she's writing about. <laughs> and, and if that doesn't make you feel old, honey. <laughs> I'm even older than you are, so it definitely makes me feel old. Yeah. But, I mean, seriously, if, you know, if the 50-year gap worked in 1989 to go back to the 30s, then in 1920, 2022, it should work to go back to the 1970s, or at least that's the way I'm going to look at it. It's also interesting to me that historical fiction has periods that people really are interested in write about and then big gaps. So if you read British historical fiction, you can go on and on about medieval. There's a wealth of historical. There's a ton of Tudor. And the English Civil War, the, the 17th century, hardly anybody ever writes about. And there are not that many, although more now, in the 18th century. If you go back to the ancient world, Egypt, really popular, a few things in Greece. There's only been one thriller I can ever remember set in Babylon. You know, so it, I don't know whether it's driven by access to materials, you know, for research or whether readers just don't find Mesopotamia sexy or what it is, you know, it's um, it's very strange. And I say that because the 1950s, hardly anybody writes about them. And yet in my new definition, we could have a whole bunch of novels set in the 50s, but we all sort of were skipping over that. Maybe the Cold War was just too boring. Maybe we were all too afraid to want to face it. I don't know. Katrina McPherson's new book is the late 40s, isn't it? There's post-war stuff coming yeah. along, but yeah. I'm talking she's, about the 50s. Yeah, but she's kind of, close to the 50s right. since that was the beginning of the national health service so yeah which leads me to my final question before we do this which is 50 years from now will there be any anybody writing about the pandemic or will it all we're just going to skip over it like we have with other times that are difficult to read about and there won't be any books set in 2019 to 2022 and if there are will people who live through it be correcting it as they go so that you know like I we were doing these graphic um, things to, for Facebook and Instagram. <clears throat> My brother-in-law likes to make these graphic images about the book and we were doing them and he kept bringing me these images of hippies 
and you could tell that they were fakes because you know the men had tattoos and the women had piercings and shaved armpits. <laughs> I was there. No. <laughs> See, there's my point. That Lori can actually. You can't be yeah. more accurate to Lori right yeah. back to 1970. Yeah. I love it. So we didn't wear masks then. We we wore masks then. <laughs> so Brock Helling is a really fascinating character. And you have written, in addition to your wonderful Mary Russell novels, several standalones. Uh, but Raquel is new. What inspired your creation of Raquel? Well, you know, we had this thing called COVID back in the 2020s. <laughs> and it meant that it was really tough to travel and do research. <clears throat> and I usually, for the Russells, I do research. And so I had a list of things that I was planning on doing, um, you know, last summer and this summer. And I thought, no, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to Paris and the south of France and Dordogne and the rest of it. So um, so you just postponed it? I postponed it, yeah. Yeah. And But I thought, you know, maybe this is the opportunity to write that book that <clears throat> I've long been thinking of is um, a, a 60s book. I had originally thought of this as a 60s book. And as time mm -hmm. goes on long enough, you know, you sort of think if, if it's a 60s book, all the all the characters are going to be now in their 80s and 90s, which it's fine, but it's kind of hard to have a suspect list of any size. So, <laughs> so, so I thought maybe it could be the 70s instead. And in fact, it, it it proved more interesting in a way than the 60s because the 70s are this interesting interim period where all of the peace and love generation was beginning to go back home because when you have kids and you know they need to eat and be in school it's hard to live up in a house in the in the woods um and it was it's before the 80s which you know 80s you find the remember the, the women's uh, shoulder pads mm -hmm. and uh, and disco music and of course aids comes in in the 80s which does a lot of um, interesting reshaping of the sexual revolution so the 70s were really interesting they were this period where where things were changing and that's always a, a, a you know that sort of inbuilt tension is always more valuable for a writer than just everyone's happy aren't we so but nonetheless it was a period where there was the war was had wound down and we hadn't yet gotten to that play mm -hmm. and so you know you could write about it and people would be willing to go there it wouldn't be too difficult mm -hmm. yes for, i mean i obviously didn't want this to be a vietnam book i wrote a vietnam book i don't, didn't need to do another one um and uh, but i i thought vietnam is the background to all the commune movement and that's what there's two timelines in the book, for those of you who don't know anything about it, which I'm assuming is maybe one of you. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> it's got two timelines. One is Inspector Lang. She is working on the cold case unit for San Francisco. And she is looking at serial killers um, who were working in the, in the 70s and 80s. And a body comes to light beneath a, a sculpture no spoilers because this is like the first chapter of the book um on the gardner estate which is halfway up the san francisco peninsula if any of you know the san francisco peninsula at all you may have been to the filoli gardens right. house and gardens this is very generally set where that is and it kind of vaguely around the same era and the gardens and stuff i mean it it's not Filoli, but it's Filoli in another universe. Right. Um, and I used to visit Filoli when I was an undergraduate, mm -hmm. but I graduated in 62 from Stanford before really we were still in that, we were really still in the 50s mm -hmm. in yeah. 1962. The mm -hmm. big, big changes started in 63 or 64. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was interesting for me to revisit Filoli or, <clears throat> excuse me, the Gardner Estate as you're writing. Yeah. You know, now, because I haven't been back to it for, you know, mm -hmm. well, I haven't been back to it, period. So it's been a long time. Yeah. So in the in the 70s, the, you know, the not Filoli, but the Gardner estate, this this fictional estate, is it changes from being a, a private home to a commune. 
the, the guy who inherits it, the ex-soldier who inherits it, makes it a commune. And I, so there was my, there was my home for all my hippies, my peace and love and flower children and all the rest. How many of you get the emus, did you know? Because I sent you the picture of Lori <laughs> in her hippie <laughs> ensemble. And it was so faded, I had to go to Photoshop and try to really, you know, bring up the colors so you could see it. But Lori has on her long dress and her beads and her long hair and the whole bit. Yeah. Look wonderful. That, I, I, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> you were right but anyway let's talk about Raquel because as I said I think she's a really interesting creation in some ways like Mary Russell but um in other ways more like Holmes yeah it was interesting I I don't write to an outline I am very much an organic writer I have a vague idea of what the story is going to be but I have no idea how I'm going to get there um, so my first draft is sort of, you can think of it as a 300 page outline that I make a four to 450 page book out of. And in the course of that, I'm, I'm figuring out how the story fits together, who the main characters are, what the setting is, how the crime that I've kind of had in the back of my mind, how it comes to life in there. And, um, when I finish the first draft, I then figure that I will go through and I will further develop the characters, especially the supporting actors, because a lot of times I'll kind of sketch them in. I'm not sure whether I need someone who is, you know, moody or someone who is humorous or, you know, the sort of balance throughout the thing. So quite often the supporting characters need to be developed out in the second draft. So I finished the first draft, sent it off to my editor. Um, she had some complicated, it was October and it was some things in the way. So she didn't get back to me very soon. I then had some health issues that just lost November. And by the time I came back to it, I, I had forgotten what this book was. I mean, I sort of knew I had written a book, but I kind <laughs> of, so when I, when I read through it, expecting to see the, the main character developed and the other characters not so much. What I found was that Raquel Lang was really enigmatic and she was very difficult to pin down. And as I, as I thought about it, and I, you know, at first I thought I'm, I really got to, I really got to make her much more, not vivid, but detailed so that people really have a very clear sense of what she looks like and what she talks like and who she is and why she's limping and all the rest of it. But as I read through the first draft with an eye to the, to the rewrite, I realized that she was, as you say, remarkably like a certain detective with a pipe and a violin. Because, you know, with Sherlock Holmes, the, the Conan Doyle character, um, you don't know anything about him. He has a brother. He comes from a family of country squires, whatever that might mean. Um, and his grandmother is the sister of the artist Vernet without explaining which Vernet. Ah, um, as in Magritte, for example. <laughs> right, but maybe not Magritte. <laughs> so, so, I mean, he's, he's a puzzle because for the, for the stories that Conan Doyle is writing, you don't need to know this. What you need to know is that this man is a brilliant mind. That worked fine in the late 19th, early 20th century. And people want more than that in their characters now. They want three-dimensional characters with relationships. But Raquel Lang just really didn't want to go there. Okay. And I found it really interesting to let her be really enigmatic. I mean, there's a lot of things about her that, I mean, sorry to give you a spoiler if you were hoping to learn this, that, and the other, but there are a lot of things about her that you that you don't know, even at the end of it. I mean, there's a lot that you do find out, but I, I mean, I found it really fascinating to write a character who was vivid and alive, but extremely reticent in giving her own details. So. so let me go back to a conversation you and I had. I mean, it must have been all the way back, maybe to the second or third book. But basically, we were talking about um, starting a series 
And Laurie made an analogy that when you're doing that, it's like packing a trunk and you put some things in it and some things you pull out for the first book and some things you leave in the trunk mm -hmm. to be explored later. Um, oh, aren't I brilliant? You, what a yeah, great idea. But once you pull them out, <laughs> you're stuck with them. You know, there's the thing. I mean, once you decide that your character, for example, um, you know, has, has blue eyes, they can't suddenly magically become completely different. Um, if you started with a particular age, you can age them very slowly, but you can't, you know, you can't change it. And so basically what you've done with Raquel, it's almost all the way back. You know, you've, you've got a big trunk, but we don't know what's in it. You've mm -hmm. just taken out a very yeah. few things, but that doesn't mean there's not more stuff in the trunk yeah. to be revealed later. And and it was, you know, as I was looking at Raquel that I realized that I wanted, I wanted to explore her more and this really needed to be a series character. Excellent. So I had, you know, you always have these conversations with your editor at the publishing house of, um, what you're going to do next. And this, because of so much uncertainty going on, um, I had I had sort of been talking about it as a standalone, possibly the first in a series, but then I think I've done a grave talent and um, touchstone. And anyway, you know, half the, the books that are beginning a series uh, were standalones in my mind to begin with. So it wasn't until I lived with the characters and I began to see how they might develop that I that I thought, ah, I want to go there. And Raquel was similar. And there's a lot of a lot of things that I really am looking forward to exploring with her and and her sister in the, in the, the book D. Um, I think it will also be a lot of fun. And it's an interesting area too. In fact, you brought Mary Russell to San Francisco mm -hmm. in one book, so she connected up with. But the thing is, Laurie and I have talked about it. She, it, it's really not a good idea, probably, to go back to Kate Martinelli, even though Laurie started with um, with Kate. I mean, that was a different time, and you know, she'd be old now, and well, like us, um, you know. Um, so yeah. it's good to have a different character, I think, to be working on now. Yeah. I I would like to write, you know, one one last one to last sort day. of bring it around to the end at some point. But um, yeah. Ah, okay. Well, there's but, some busy um, right there. But you know, part of the problem is when you've gone a long a long time. I mean, the last novel, the last Kate novel was nearly twenty years ago, and to convince your publisher that it's a great idea. If they started a television series out of it, that would that would change matters. But um, you know, other other than that, I I'm not sure. But I I liked the idea of having a bit of overlap and yeah. bringing Al Hawken in. And well, you're so, in the same place. Yeah, with different the same place, same you know, same kind of situation and with with al to sort of give continuity so right no i think it's brilliant i really like raquel and my husband who hasn't read a lot of worries work snatched it from my hands because he says this is a title to a song does anybody know back to the guard should we all burst into song so <laughs> i did i mean yeah rob, yeah. rob actually the 1970s are his period too yeah. but he said you are I, stardust you are golden <laughs> you got anyway, to get yourself back right. to the garden so he wraps it and we'll we'll see what's going on um excuse me a second pat can you hear me would you come up here and turn off the door chime please i don't know how to do it or i'd get up and do it but the buzz buzz thing is driving me crazy i can't tell people not to open the door and come in right so, <laughs> but there is a way to turn it on do you know when I started the store, I was the only employee for two and a half years and I knew how to do everything. And today I can barely sell a book. I can't ship anything. I have no idea how anything works. That's really, including the door chime, for example. It's just pathetic. She had to really work to figure out the air conditioning in the back room. I did. I did. It's not my job. <laughs> not anymore. It's sort of embarrassing. Yeah. But but that's sort of my point about Kate Martinelli in a way. You know, if she's you know a relic of an earlier time, then it's probably better to be, yeah. you know, bringing along somebody new. It also, uh, you know, 
there's a lot of complicated uh, copyright questions and who's in charge of what and you know who 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 owns Kate I mean I do on one hand but if if you're selling rights to for example a TV show on the Kate do you not can you have this because she's in it and uh, so I think we we decided it was easiest to leave the the main the Kate character out of it at this point. She may she may pop in as a sort of guest in some of one of the maybe future she ones. Could mentor if Raquel actually needs mentoring, but maybe she could be a consultant in a cold crime case or something. Yeah, that yeah. could be good. Yeah, right. So tell us more about Ra what what little do you know about Raquel you can share with us? <laughs> well, I I think that I mean Raquel has that distinct ability to to read people and to um to analyze facts at the drop of a hat like like Holmes does right um in mo in a modern era they, they've developed a whole science out of micro expressions and there's a couple of books written about <clears throat> about it there's a course that you can take and some of it you know, some of it is probably a bit over the top but there's a lot of it that by for example if you film someone that you are interrogating and slow the film down you can sometimes spot these little tiny expressions that last a 30th of a second of contempt or um humor that they're laughing at at you um, there's a lot of them that have done are done with various political things, like the, the famous Clinton of I did not have sexual relations. Um, and that if you analyze the micro expressions that are going on, quite often it betrays what they're saying. And I found that so fascinating of you can do it with a camera, but what if you could do it if, face to face? If you were quick enough if your eyes and your brain were quick enough to do it face to face so that is that is a particular skill that she she has and develops um that i that i found a, a sort of interesting modern um you know more, more contemporary way of looking at crime than Sherlock Holmes and his fingerprints the cut the cutting edge technology of fingerprints <laughs> So in a way, sort of a human lie detector is what you're saying. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, because it's fiction, I, I I can make things up. But I think that there are certainly people who 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 do that. I mean, professionally, they that's what they do. And a lot of the bigger police departments have consultants um on on that kind of thing. So well, there's a whole neuroscience thing. If any of you watch, I recommend it to you, and I'm gonna do it again because it's so absolutely amazing. There's a Korean program with subtitles called Extraordinary Attorney Wu, which may be the best thing I've seen on television since Call My Agent. And she is autistic. Um, and, and it's really interesting that way. But in the most recent one, it's a courtroom drama. And there is a witness that they are fairly sure is, maybe it was the one before. But anyway, where are the witnesses? It's pretty clear that the witness is going to be lying in order to uh, give the other side an advantage. And an attorney who gets a crash course in how to tell somebody is lying. And some of it is really fascinating in that it can affect your nose. And if you're lying, not only will your nose maybe start to drip, but it will turn red. Or you may betray yourself by this. People who are lying are very often, no, my nose is not turning red, I'm still have to lie for here. Um, or there, there are certain, you know, hand movements or sending. Then, and that, in a sense, is sort of voluntary, but some of the reactions, the systolic reaction and so forth, it's involuntary. Mm -hmm. And it's because lying puts stress on people. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, it ups your blood pressure, you have to pay more attention. And I, I, I haven't checked to see if that is real science or they just made it up for the TV. I mean, I, I can't tell you that it's absolutely true that this might happen to you. But I thought, as we're learning more about neuroscience, it will be possible to tell more and more mm. often by close observation, especially with video mm. and all, because now cops are videoing all their interviews. If you watch 
any crime shows, for example, you will see that, you know, it used to be they just turned on the audio, but now they're actually videoing interviews mm -hmm. with suspects. And so you should be able to tell, yeah. you know, if any of that that I just went through is absolutely true. Yeah. They had that show, I Spy, I think it was on for about three years, and the whole thing was really making. I Spy was, a, was also like that. Yeah. It yeah. Was saying, um, they may slow it down when he's trying to explain why the person was lying. It's still on from the channels. Well, neuroscience is fascinating. We all have two neural systems, one of which is voluntary. You can control it, like doing this. But the sympathetic nerve system, we can't control it. That's where you get hiccups. Hiccups are a glitch in your sympathetic nervous system. And do you all know, by the way, I'll just throw this out here for you. Do you all know there's one sure cure for hiccups? No, it's citric acid. If you get the hiccups, run for the nearest lemon or lime or grapefruit and cut a slice and bite into it. And the shock of the citric acid will jolt your sympathetic nervous system and stop them. I have been known, <laughs> I have known to go up to complete strangers in bars, you know, bar behind the bar and say, you know, quick, can I have a lemon slice? And they all look at it like, what? You know, and, but it really works. Um, so there you the go. You heard it here. The sympathetic nervous system is what would make your nose turn red or, and you couldn't, you can't control it even if you want to. So if in fact we betray ourselves when we're lying by reactions to the sympathetic nervous system, that would that would work. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of debate on that for someone who is sociopathic, who is psychopathic, right. who who doesn't react in a normal way. Right. Um, and if they if they are not giving those betraying uh, those betraying gestures is it because they are indeed innocent or is it because they just their sympathetic they nervous system is not plugged the same in way. yeah yeah Did you have your hand about me? yeah i had a comment i was watching um a show that showed interviews with the guy that murdered his wife and his three kids or his two kids you mean that lawyer in north carolina or the insurance I'm sorry? agent was it the insurance agent or lawyer uh no um he uh, uh he was uh, he uh, he murdered his wife and during the uh he when he murdered his wife and the kids um he had strangled them and during the course of the interview with the police they had the interview um uh, we were watching the interview he touched his neck a lot and the detectives felt that that was a giveaway that they thought that he uh, subconsciously was you know i strangled her mm -hmm. so i thought that was interesting Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of th this sort of, uh, you can also, you can also buy machines that you can put on your desk as an executive, it tells you when your interviewee is lying, and you think, yeah, no, 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 not really. Um, I think there's a, a lot of this sort of amateur, I mean, did he strangle his wife because he's touching his neck? Or is it just that he's nervous because he's in a room and everyone right. so um, or or whatever? I mean, you you kind of have to know you you'd have to be able to do a baseline for that individual mm -hmm. and to know is this somebody who's forever scratching his neck because he has hives or whatever. So all right. So we have Raquel, who we've now defined um as as, far as, as well as we know. can. Right. And so what is it that brings her to the to the state? Well, Raquel is currently seconded to the um, the cold case unit of the San Francisco Police Department. Um, and working with Al Hawken, who was the partner when he was fully employed, was the partner <clears throat> of uh, Kate Martinelli, but is now in cold case. And they are investigating a, a serial killer who is Kind of vaguely like i mean i didn't really know a lot about the man when i first started but there was enough similarity between the two that I, it worked fine for me joseph d'angelo joseph d'angelo was a cop who started committing a series of um break-ins rapes and murders all up and down california and because he he wandered up and down so much um they thought he was three different people 
and he had three different nicknames. Um, he killed people and over a 10 year period and then stopped right. um, and wasn't caught for years and years and years. And you have to wonder, you know, how, how many serial killers were operating in those times, especially in the days before there was DNA. And I think as soon as DNA came in, there was a sort of threat that you might get caught. Um, but the, the possibility that there was this half known serial killer working in the 70s, um, when a body comes to light with some similar characteristics to some of his victims, um, Raquel Lang goes down there looking at, um, at the situation. Um, she finds that this place used to be a commune, is now a historical house and garden, and um, and begins to investigate in the in the in the house's archives and finding what was going on in the seventies. Um, you know, it, it was this period where it was moving between being, as I said, a family home and being a a, a commune. Um, and what was going on when this when these bones went under this statue? So that's what she's doing there. Right. And so you know, of course, that when you're reading an opening chapter, they're going to move the mammoth statue in the garden. You know, uh, all uh, experienced uh, mystery readers know uh, there will be bones, right? There uh, will be bones under the statue. Because the statue's been there for so long. The body can't be fresh. It has to be bones, hence the, you know, hence the cold case. And that's where we get into the historical because Lori instead of just doing, you know, having Raquel leaking through records, Laurie actually goes back and writes all the 70s scenes from when the estate is inherited by the Vietnam veteran who is so blasted by the war that he's living off in the Redwoods or whatever it is and doesn't want the estate and, and comes back. And he has a younger brother who has decamped. And so the question is, you know, will the heirs own the estate or what will happen to the estate? And the hippie brother decides to run it as a commune, right? Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's interesting. I'm sure that, I'm sure that we've all read um, cold case books and they, they all have to choose a way of structuring it. Either you have from 1972 up to 1979, and that's, you know, it's all one unit and you read it and you, you have that story. And then you have the modern day and it goes on. Well, that's functional, but it doesn't allow the writer to really get the maximum amount of tension out of it. Right. So by weaving together the various interviews that she is doing, that Raquel Lang is doing with these chapters that are, you are there. Um, it's tricky because there's stuff that is told in the chapters that Raquel doesn't need to know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there that is, but you kind of think the reader needs to know because if you're looking at the entire picture of who these people were in the 70s, um, you're not just looking at the facts that led to that those bones under that statue. You're looking at the bigger picture. And I, I found that the really interesting part of putting them together is how much you could tell the reader without the reader saying, but, you know, she she wouldn't need to know this. Or she, if she knows this, why isn't she doing X? So the amount that you give in each place is really, I, I found a really interesting writing exercise, as it were. So it was. And the fact that you, you know, yourself were a witness to it made it real. I'll tell you, it was unnerving for me because this whole period was part of my life and I wasn't there. So I found out all sorts of things. I was in like a parallel world, right? Back in Virginia. <laughs> and reading about it, I thought, Lord, all that was going on and I never yeah. knew it. You know, yeah. I mean, it's very odd when your life turns into history and then you recognize that there's so much about it mm -hmm. that you lived yeah. through that you had no clue what was going on while you were living through it. They had three mass killers were operating in little Santa Cruz County at once. Um, there was a, really? a man, a man who killed a family of a doctor, a, a 
oral surgeon, his wife, his secretary, and kids um, just all at once. So that's a that's a mass killing. And there were there were two serial killers that one of them was caught and arrested, and killings went on. And they thought, but he did it. And it wasn't until you know the killings kept going that they realized we have two, which is so unlikely. And indeed, it's one of the reasons why the FBI developed this whole nationwide mm -hmm. project in looking at, <clears throat> at unrelated killings. And one reason the serial killers got away with it for so long is there wasn't like a national database. And so, you know, they, I mean, one of the theories about Jack the Ripper is the, my favorite theory is he just came home to Chicago because there was somebody operating like Jack the Ripper in Chicago and, you know, there was no bar to him having just left London and gone somewhere else, but it's impossible now to, but today, yeah. you know, you, you might be able to it's work a that out, but you couldn't do it in uh, 1890. Even then, I mean, there's a huge debate of how many serial killers are operating in the United States right now. Are there nine or 10? Are there 2000? I mean, I've read both, both statements. Right. And then they have <laughs> so, a debate. Yeah, that's a big difference. I'm trying to remember who I was talking to some days, it's like three authors, you know, in a row. I can't remember who it was I was talking to, but the whole question came up, is serial killing dying down in favor of serial shooters? Yeah. It's the same yeah. rage that um, mm -hmm. our sense of lack of visibility or respect mm -hmm. that used to perhaps fuel serial killers, although some of that was clearly sexual. Has that been translated now to serial shooters who yeah. just, you know, who want to do maximum damage and, you know, be momentarily famous on the internet and all the rest of it? And I don't know whether serial killers are being replaced by serial shooters or they're all going on at the same time. But as you say, um, you know, in the 70s, <clears throat> before everyone had constant communication, <clears throat> I hitchhiked. I often would be standing out there hitchhiking in the 70s. Um, you know, I got into pickup trucks with a guy uh, without really thinking about it. Um, because I didn't have a television. I didn't listen to the radio. I, you know, I, who knew? Yeah. And, and that was why, I mean, it wasn't until, wasn't until around the eighties that you stopped seeing single people um, hitchhiking on, uh, yeah, on you the made that point that there were people, especially on freeway access roads, you know, there would be people who, yeah. would, um, girls because it, we were a lot more naive and you know it felt like you were safer yeah right so that's more or less all we can tell you about back to the garden without spoiling it i found it fascinating and i i think it's perfectly seamless as you read along between the present and the 1970s theme. oh good i'm glad you found it, it it was and there wasn't you know it didn't have to have italics or it didn't have to have like red type or you know whatever it is it does have it. then and now at the top it does, but, but, you know, the, but, but the, the, the points of view are are very clear and you know it isn't at all distracting to to be doing that and you know you're right it's an interesting structural choice about about how to do it but i found it fascinating i mean it's not time travel Actually, we did a, a program Thursday night with Diana Gabaldon and A.G. Riddle about time travel. And after we had done like 50 minutes of it, and it's all about time travel to the past, I pointed out there are plenty of books where there's time travel to the future, you know, because it, it isn't always going back to the past. Sometimes, you know, it's jumping ahead. And that, but there are interesting ethical questions that come in about, you know, can you do anything that would alter the future or can you do anything in the future? That would all do the past. And then I realized Julian McAllister had a number one bestseller like three weeks ago, which involved a mother who watches her son kill somebody outside their home. And then she goes back in the past in order to see if she can prevent it from ever happening, mm -hmm. which is against the moral code of almost all time travel books where you're never supposed to do anything that will change the present or, you know, one way or the other. Yes, it. You have to remember what which time travel writer you're you're reading at the time yep. because there's different rules. So that that's that's right. Right. Jody Taylor has a thing that you can't if you start messing with anything, history will punish you. 
right. you know, the, the, the forces that are history will refuse to let you actually do anything to change the past. So, you know, you die or you <laughs> think right. explodes or whatever, but not everyone does that. And so you have to think now, is this, is this a Jody Taylor time travel or somebody else? <laughs> <laughs> and there are things that you have to think about. For example, um, well, I'll just, because I thought this was so much fun in the book that Mr. Riddle wrote, the modern society is getting rid of its criminals by time traveling them back to the age of the dinosaurs, which as I pointed out, is exactly what the British do, sending people to Botany Bay in Australia, which really for the British was sort of like going back to the, you know, but anyway, then, then Diana said, you know, well, what age did you go to? Or Sherry do the answer. And he picked the Triassic because dinosaurs were little as compared to the giant ones. And so the humans had a, some chance of survival in the Triassic age versus they'd gone back to the, you know, or the T-Rex or whatever would have just stopped them. That would have been the end of it. Oh. So, you know, there are all kinds of things you really have to think about. Know you? your history. Huh? That's right. <laughs> anyway, do any of you have questions that you would like to ask? Lots of, let's start with you over here. So, you know, we all think DNA is improving modern detection. However, for example, the gold state killer that you were referring to, they thought was the secret the world's ancestry DNA guy. Um, he was a serial rapist. It was it's funny, it's, it's very clear progression. He was a serial house invader, but he stole weird stuff, you know, like underwear. And there was he was a serial rapist, and then he was a serial murderer. And so there's a clear progression. And when they have they actually currently have tens of thousands of uh, fun evaluated rape kits in the United States. And when they go through and get grants in California, Paul Holmes provides information about this. And when they go through and get grants to test them, they almost always find in the back of serial, serial rapist. And so it's kind of interesting that we've gone from 4% conviction rate of rapists to 2% in the last 50 years. So it's, it, you know, every, the constant theme is Look how much better we are because of DNA. But in many cases, I think they're missing the boat, both the missing the progression. You know, if they stopped them as a serial rapist, which they couldn't because they didn't have DNA at the time, but currently they could stop serial rapists now to not progress. Yeah. To, yeah, the, the the comment was about um serial the sequence of, for example, Joseph D'Angelo was from home invasion to a serial rapist to a serial killer. And and how if they had had DNA tests and if they had run the DNA tests back when he was still in that interim period, um, they might have caught him then rather than. So, yeah, um, I, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons to actually clear out the DNA test backlog. And that's one of them, because, yeah, I mean, there, there is definitely a progression in uh, in, in the criminal mind. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Have you been surprised by any of the feedback you've gotten from your writers in this novel? Or I mean, anything you mentioned or done that surprised you? Well, the book isn't out yet. So oh. it doesn't Sorry. come out. Sorry. That's no. okay. It doesn't come out until Tuesday. So That's right. unless you're here. Okay. Um, How about there, there your other have any opportunities to read it? Other books. You've been surprised by the feedback you got. Um, am I surprised by the feedback I got on my novels from yeah, readers. From readers in general? Usually well, I'm always surprised that people will actually buy them and read them. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's a really lovely surprise. And, but, um, you know, it's, I'm always fascinated by how readers make a, a personal relationship with characters. And I have had a number of people tell me of specific specific things in the books that really spoke to them that I, I, you know, I really wouldn't have, wouldn't have expected. Um, there's one scene in, I, th I think it's Monstrous Regiment of Women, where um, <laughs> the, the villain has tried to, has tried to um, make Mary Russell addicted to drugs. And she, when she escapes, she takes the needle and she breaks it on, on the table. Um, and I had someone come up to me at a signing and say that she read that scene 
And she wanted me to know that she'd been clean and sober for two years since then. And I thought, you know, I mean, you don't write fiction to make people clean and sober, but to have something that, you know, it's just part of a story, but obviously speaks so profoundly to someone in their lives. I, I found really fascinating. And I, you know, to have, I mean, I'm sure that you come across that all the time of people who, for whom fiction has a deeper voice than just an entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it depends on where you are when you read it. Yeah. You know, I mean, books speak to us at different times in our lives. I know a lot of people read books over and over again in the course of their life. I don't do that because I don't want the my, the original impact of the book, you know, whatever it was at the time I read it. I don't want to change it. Um, but plenty of people um, derive enormous pleasure out of reading books at different stages. Yes, ma'am. How do you name your characters? How do I name my characters? How do you name them? Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes they're fairly easy and other times I really have to, I have to work at it. Um, I, in, in this book, I had a lot of problems with the name Gardner, for example. Um, my first, it's, it's always interesting for somebody like me who, <clears throat> who doesn't write to an outline and basically has no idea what they're going to do, but needs to give her publisher something. So they say, oh, she knows what she's doing. <laughs> so, so I'll write this, you know, page or two of absolute nonsense. I have no clue what I'm going to do, but, it, you know, it makes sense. So, and that one that I, I, I came across it recently, and I, I had named the character Rittenhouse. And then at some point they got changed to Carpenter. And I played with Gardner. And at first I thought it didn't work well because I already used the word garden in all kinds of ways in the book. And then, then I thought, it, no, it did work. And so, I, you know, so it's, it's things like that that just drive you crazy and make you say, just name the people, <laughs> just give them a name and just call them X and just deal with it. Um, other times I know that I want I want a certain kind of feel in the mouth so that Raquel Lang is in the front of the mouth. It's um, she is very crisp and clear. And um, as, as opposed to, um, you know, to, to some of the other kinds of names, which are rounder or more, uh, they're multisyllabic. Um, you also have to think of how it looks on the page because some things look right, wrong on the page. So I, Right. If it's too long a name, that can be confusing. I'll tell you yeah. something really interesting. David Morrell, who you may know, wrote um, First Blood, which became Rambo and has been a really successful thriller writer. I was visiting him in Santa Fe and we were sitting in this writing room one day and he said, I just had a breakthrough. Oh, I said, what's that? And he said, well, I've been working on this book and I just, I just can't get it right. And then he said, I changed the name and I just used global replace. And as soon as I changed the name, he said the whole book came back to life and I could figure out what to do. And it, you know, so the point was there that names have emotional freight. They do for you as a reader and they do for the author. And if your name, that the name isn't resonating with the author, it's a problem. And then sometimes when you read a book, you might have known somebody named Bruce, for example, that you hated. And you know, there's a Bruce in the book or any other name. Um, mm -hmm. you could, you know, it might affect how you read the book. You could. Yeah. That's why pseudonyms for authors are usually very short. There are lots of authors, you know, who don't write under their real name. Either it's an, well, like movie stars, you know, I mean, um, Carrie Green has a new memoir out about his, um, thing with LSD. There's a, not a memoir, sorry, um, a biography about Carrie Green and LSD, but his real name is Archie Leach. So, you know, would it have the same resonance if, you know, Archie Leach, whatever, as opposed to the movie star, Cary Green, and, you know, yeah, no and a lot of those names were kept deeply secret. Yeah. So, you know, there we are. Great subject names. Great question. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. So since um, we're allowed to move about more, have you started your um, travel for the Mary Russell section? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was supposed to go to England this summer, but because of various uh, lingering health issues and the fact that COVID was back again, and 
the weather in England is just insane. I didn't go. Um, I, I think I may. I'm I'm looking at late fall, I'm probably going to be early spring, but um, yeah, yeah, I think I, I need to uh, I need to decide where I'm going and just Do start it. start booking. So I've done two research trips with Lori. My husband and I went with her to Japan to research that book, which she very kindly of dedicated to us. And then um, we all took a trip on the lower Danube, a group of us, and we ended up, we started in Romania. So the last Mary Russell was Marie, the Queen of Romania. And I helpfully pointed out things to Lori, like, wait, all of which yep. she disregarded. But <laughs> <none of them. laughs> Even in the museum, remember, I was taking pictures of Queen Marie, the, the, the box that she gave to somebody in England as a, you know, way of connecting in the hall bit that Lori, Lori just smiles and then does it as she wants. <laughs> Um, it's fun. And, you know, watching an author do something like that, it's not like they're, you know, dictating into things or taking notes or whatever it is. They're mostly listening to conversations to get the dialogue and the rhythms right, looking around to see what interesting things, you know, Google Street Maps is not going to give you the smell of the cafe in Budapest where we haunted it every morning. Astonishing <laughs> food. Um, astonishingly yeah. famous place, too, but it was a cafe. Starts with a G. We're going to have a senior moment here, right? Yeah, senior moment. Sorry. Give, 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 uh, well, anyway, famous Hungarian Budapest camping. So, right. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I don't recall if any of your books have been made into TV or film. Not yet. Why do you think that the Mary books happened? Um, they've been optioned to three different places. Uh -huh. um, the last one went on for really a ridiculously long time because of COVID. I mean, it, you couldn't really blame production companies for not being able to commit to something when they didn't know when they'd be able to commit to it. So um, that's just come out of option and my agents are um, going to be selling it around again. So, do, do you want them to be? I think it would be interesting. Um, I think this would be an interesting one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you think too. this would be a really interesting and it wouldn't series. Have the copyright. There's always been a problem with the Conan Doyle estate. Um, and, you know, that's gone on for, it finally got resolved. But when yeah. Lori was first writing the books, the, there were differences in the UK and the US copyrights, and, mm -hmm. and it was a real problem. So that may have discouraged. Also, there's been a lot of TV about you know, there's yep. Benedict Cumberbatch and all the rest of it. Yeah, so. there's a sensation. Yeah, there is, more. right. You know, but I think, I think yeah. Raquel might have, um, I agree with Lori, might have a better cheese. Yes, ma'am, I saw a hand back there. It was, it was actually the question about uh, television. Oh, the same, the, the same the television thing. question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. So, anybody else? Don't check a bag. Go to England. I'm sorry. Don't check any bags. Go to England. Oh, yeah. I recently came back from three weeks in the UK, and there are 700 bags in the warehouse sitting there that they don't even know where they go. People are losing right to So carry ons. And the other thing the CA has been doing is canceling intra UK flights. So all my flights from Heathrow to Manchester to Edinburgh yeah. all get canceled. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been training a lot. You know, learning by training. So anyway, it's Maybe by the spring. Be so Maybe. Lufthansa yeah. has just canceled and a ton of flights and they're having strikes. And you know, the airline industry was forced to lay everybody off and they, yeah. they have not been able to pull it all back yeah. together. And, and it's that, like the healthcare agent. Who would yeah. want to be one? I mean, right. would you really want to be a flight attendant? I don't think so. But it's ground support, it's baggage handlers, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's people in the airport. That's you know, it's, it's not just any one part of the whole thing. Sure. It's, it goes on yeah. and on. Well, thank you all very much for your attention. We've come up on an hour. Okay. Thank you. Did you have a chance to look? Were there any Facebook questions? Or I'm, I can take a look right now. They're going to see my my mug here just okay. for a second. Just in case anybody had a burning question on Facebook. I apologize. Yep. We're going to do that in just a second. We're just working our way through the technological issue that this point does this afternoon. I'm going to turn off my phone. Pardon me. And say thank you to all those people. Thank you. And well, I'm surprised we had enough power to do that. Bye. There we go. Let's see. Reload page.
There we are. All right. So Mark wanted to know how long it took you to write your book. How long did it take me to write a book? Um, I tend to write a book, uh, roughly a book a year. This one took um, 15 months, I think, um, because COVID. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I am, I think now on a schedule of slightly more than a year. Perfect. Everybody else is excited to see that there's plenty coming from Mary's trunk. And we'll be seeing more pretty soon. And uh, otherwise, a lot of greetings from everywhere, from California to, uh, it looks like, Florida, Nashville, a random Pinocchio, somewhere in there. Um, <laughs> and uh, other than that, I think that was, uh, that was the okay. only question from Facebook. So well, Facebook, for, we're going to log off now. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. You bet. So I have good news for you, Sherlock Holmes fans. Bonnie McBurton, who writes a wonderful Sherlock Holmes series, I don't know if any of you read it, um, has just told me that she is going to do an event with us in November. Oh, lovely. So, yeah, she's well, a, nice, good people. She's, she's really a lovely good person. People. She can't leave the UK because her husband is dying of cancer and she doesn't want to leave him. So it's like,